invitation to come. Thank you for all the support and encouragement that you give the persecuted church, because I think uh, often praise with them. Um, there's a prayer meeting every second, third, second? <coughs> Uh, fun day at Holland Road. I don't know if anybody's welcome to come and join us. I'm going to hang our um, time together on a few verses from Galatians chapter 6, starting with verse 7. Galatians 6 and verse 7. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please his sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of faith. And I mean there's a few basic scriptural principles there. Um, that a man reaps what he sows. And we know that's true in, in practical life as well. And in the parable of the sower, the sower was spreading seed it was far and wide, and he knew some of it wouldn't grow because it landed on the, the path or in the weeds. But he wanted to make sure he got as much crop from the, the seed as he did. And as we sow in spiritual terms, so we reap back so much more. And we're told there to uh, do good to all people, which I'm sure we do, if people are in trouble in your own fellowship, I'm sure you're rallying around. If there's new babies, probably you're taking cash rolls around to the mum and, and dad. Um, when your friends leave, no doubt if they need help packing and waving goodbye, you'll do that for them. Um, so it's, it's normal <coughs> Christian practice, and really as part of Open Doors, we're just asking you to look a bit wider to the wider family. And we are part of one family. We might be talking about uh, Syrian Christians or Nigerian Christians, but they're exactly the same as you and me. They've got the licorice in the middle. Acts 1.12 tells us that as many of people who received him, to those who believed in his name, God gives them the right to become children of God. And so all the people we're talking about have, just like you and me, given their lives to Christ, they've become Christians, they're filled with the Holy Spirit, and they're part of our family because we've all got the same father. Open Door started about 60 years ago. It's their 60th anniversary. And one of the verses that have inspired us throughout is Revelation 3.2. Awake and strengthen that which remains and is on the point of death. And that's what we've been doing all, all the way. Brother Andrew was inspired to take Bibles to places like Yugoslavia and Poland. Um, and Open Doors always works with local Christians. We don't, we're not a doctor. We don't say, this is your problem, this is your cure, this is what we're going to do for you. We ask local Christians what help they need, and if we can give it, we give it in all kinds of different ways. It's interesting that uh, we've got friends here from Albania. That was one of the first well, it was the first country that decided it would become an atheist state. And as far as the, the government was concerned, they wanted to wipe out all Christian witness at all. But we were strengthening that which remained. And when he was overthrown, they found there was still a church meeting underground. And I think it was in the 80s or 90s, Open Doors took Bibles to them because that's what they were asking for. And we're still doing that today. Open Doors started with Brother Andrew taking Bibles into Yugoslavia. We've done it in Albania, we've done it in China. Um, and last year we took in 3.1 million bits of Bible, Gospels, New Testaments, tracts, <coughs> to different countries around the world. We trained over 300,000 people in spiritual things, whether it's pastors, whether it's Sunday school teachers, whether it's discipleship, because there's a real need and hunger to train people to pass on the good news. In many places, the earliest Christian will be expected to be the, the, uh, the pastor. And he might only have been a Christian for a month or two months. And so there's a real need to train pastors to be able to, to share their faith. 
We're doing lots of livelihood and community projects. We, we train people to do trades so that if they're left by themselves, if a, a wife is widowed, she might not have any means of making a living. And so we would perhaps teach her in hair to, to, to cut hair, to make dresses so that she can start her own business. And I said we did over 356,000 people were trained in different things like that. We helped in projects, maybe giving them rent so they could rent a shop to sell their wares, maybe in providing um, apple trees so they can have an orchard of their own, maybe giving them a cow so they can sell milk and yogurt. All kinds of different things. We spent over two million pounds last year in education. In many countries, uh, not everybody can go to school. In, in places like Egypt, you have to provide your own pencils and papers, and as Christians are often the poorest in their, in their community, they, haven't, they can't do that, and so we can buy things like that. You might have to pay fees to go, and again, that will be outside the ability of many Christians to be able to do that. We provide safe houses. If a Muslim becomes a Christian, they will be challenged and threatened by their family. We met a pastor who, whose brother-in-law was an imam, and there was a real threat on his life. And he was telling about it, and all of a sudden there was a knock on the door, and everybody jumped. But fortunately it was his wife coming back. But there's a real need for safe houses, because Christians, because they bring shame on the family by changing their faith, need a safe house. We help in emergency relief, so that when there's a, um, a tsunami or a flood, because we've got people on the ground, we can get money to people working there. And recently we're doing far more legal work. Uh, again, because Christians might be falsely accused, they need solicitors, but they can't afford them, so we would do that. We're doing far more trauma counselling, as more and more Christians are moving from place to place, um, not through any fault of their own. They're seeing all kinds of dreadful things going on. We help to pay for children's camps. But over the years, we've learned that we're also learning from the persecuted church. Uh, and in many cases, they feel we have a harder existence because there's so much affluence. Even in China, in India, places that are getting more affluent, they're finding Christians are turning away because people can think they can do it by themselves. And in countries like Ayers, if we're successful, if we've got everything we need, why do we need God? And so. Having affluence and, and ease does make it easier. And often being under pressure and being persecuted makes it easier to, to follow the law, to depend on him. Where the persecution is the worst, that's where God is doing the greatest things. The worst persecution ever was on Easter Sunday. Jesus was totally innocent, was falsely accused, had a joke of a trial, was beaten, was eventually crucified and died. And that's when God did the greatest miracle in raising them to life. And we know throughout the Bible that when the need is the greatest, when people are at their most desperate, that's where we see God doing the most amazing thing. So we can learn from them from that. We can learn their hunger for the word of God. We've been in, in churches in the Himalayas where before the reading everybody stands up and holds their Bible aloft and thanks God that they've got his word. We learn about prayer from them. You know, when there was a big crisis in Egypt, thousands of people got together to pray all night. Now, I've never been to a prayer meeting like that. You know, our prayer meetings are, we have a cup of coffee, we talk about it, we pray for half an hour, we have another cup of coffee, we go home. But Christians under pressure cry out to God, believing things are going to happen. Um, and so often... God is faithful and, and things do happen. And we, I don't think we've ever been and met a Christian abroad who hasn't asked us to pray for them. And they do that, not because that's the Christian thing to do. It's because they believe in the power of prayer and want us to bless them. And they always pray and say that they would pray for us as well, which is great. We can learn from them from their generosity. Again, in houses we visited, people have got very little. <clears throat> but they rush out and buy a melon and a, a, a loaf of bread so they can share with us. Um, and they are just generous. They want to show God's love to people that visit them. And we can learn about them forgiving. 
we're going to hear in just a minute from somebody who saw her husband killed uh, in Nigeria. There was a riot and he was taking a blind person home and came across people and he was murdered. And that woman had very little forgiveness. She, and understandably so. And yet that supernatural gift of the Spirit enabled her to forgive. And in the, the parable of the unforgiving servant, you remember that one servant appealed to the king because he owed him so much money and the king forgave him. And then he wouldn't forgive another servant who owed him very little. And the end of the story is really fine frightened because the king said when he heard about it, he put him in jail to be tortured. And if we don't forgive, and certainly that was my experience, when I don't forgive somebody, when the person comes in the door you tense up, you f you're torturing yourself. And that's what God tells us to do. So we really need to be able to forgive people. And often, again, from my experience, you, you say, I'm, I'm going to forgive that person for doing that. And the person looks at you and says, I didn't even realise that was a problem. So if you, yeah, it might be, he criticised my tyres. So yeah, it, it's often that sort of symbol and that sort of pathetic. And yet God has forgiven us so much that we need to be able to do that. And we're going to tell you about Damaris. Um, she was left with four children. And I'm going to tell you what she has to say. Tamara says, when my husband died, I felt useless and hopeless. Then God sent you people as angels to raise me up and give me hope. I have been provided with food, clothing, school fees and most of all prayer. As a body we have suffered as a result of the activities of Boko Haram. They have bombed and burned down many churches, killed many people and destroyed many properties. I share my story and encourage the brethren to continue to have hope in the Lord, no matter what the situation. If I do not forgive, the Lord Jesus will never forgive me. So I have forgiven, and God will help me love everybody. <coughs> it's not easy, but it is God that will give us the grace to love. I share my story and encourage the brethren to continue to have hope in the Lord no matter what their situation. So there's a very ordinary person doing extraordinary things because of God's Holy Spirit. And that's like us. We're very ordinary people, but with God we can do extraordinary things. One of the, well, the biggest ever project that Open Doors did was to take a million Bibles into China on one night, which we did by loading up a, a barge, which was towed into a a secluded bay. The barge was sunk and the Bibles which were wrapped in tarpaulin all bobbed into shore where Christians were waiting to, to take them throughout China. It took over five years but the, these Bibles were so sought after. Brother Lee got one um, and before he had his own Bible the nearest Bible was 14 miles away so he had to cycle over to the pastor's house, read the Bible for an hour, cycle 14 miles back. When he got his Bible, <coughs> he read it right through from cover to cover. The second week he did it again, and the third week he did it again, and he decided to become an itinerant evangelist. Fifteen years later, he was pastor to 400,000 people. A 14-year-old girl, we're told, planted 400 house churches. I'm guessing that took a while, but it's so remarkable, isn't it? A 14-year-old girl when she started. And if you're older than that, I don't think you're an adult, because a 91-year-old started three churches in Tibet. Sister Chang was another Chinese Christian, and she felt God telling her to go and preach on the, the, the steps of the police station. <coughs> and a bit like Ananias, she said to God, mm, I don't know, this is a great idea. If I do that, I'm going to be arrested. But she really felt that God was calling her to do that, so she did. Within five minutes she was arrested. She was put in prison where she made 800 converts. And at the end of her sentence, the governor called her into the office and said, there's no chance you'd stay on, is there? You've made such a difference, we'd uh, be really grateful if you would. Uh, if you do, we'll give you an apartment, we'll give you a car, we'll pay you a salary. But she felt the government would go back to her village, so she turned it down. 
And being in prison can make a real difference. Christians can testify by their lives and by what they do in prison. And very often they'll bring more people to Christ. <clears throat> a couple of years ago we met Hannah, who was a head teacher and a pastor's wife, brother of two. Every day, uh, she lived in Damascus, <coughs> every day she would pra pray Psalm 91 over her class and her children, which is the, the parable about um, he won't he'll put his angels to guard you, you'll be in the shadow of his wings. And they, that's a verse, a, a, a psalm that our brothers and sisters really depend upon. And as a result, they don't fear death. They told their children that um, if, if they saw their killers, they should tell them that God loved them. Every day they prayed that if they didn't come back, not to be, be fearful, because the next place they see would be Jesus. And lots of their brothers and sisters don't fear death. And I don't think we should either. Um, I know we, often we do. But if we do die, we're going to be in heaven with God. And that's got to be better than here. And that's what Paul was saying throughout his letters, wasn't he? That he wanted to stay on earth, but he knew that heaven was going to be far better. And this is, again, a truth that our brothers and sisters are facing. And this is what Hannah says. <coughs> Every day we say goodbye to each other as if it's the last time. Every day we pray, please let us meet again at the end of the day. And every night we give thanks that that prayer has been answered. Every day we read Psalm 91 over our children and they use it as a prayer. That they believe it out is a great encouragement to us. We tell them that if terrorists come, not to be afraid, because if they kill us, we will wake up with Jesus and we tell them to tell their killers that God loves them. When we met Hannah, um, not one person in her church had been killed, which in Damascus at that time was, was miraculous. And they told on several, well, certainly on more than one occasion, they felt compelled by God to go in a different direction and they missed the car bomb. Um, we met another couple of Iranians as well last year who, who have been in prison. In three years, they distributed 20,000 New Testaments in different areas of Iran. And they didn't just go <coughs> and give them willy nilly, they would sort of go into an area, go into a coffee bar, start talking to people. And if people were showing an interest, they would give them a New Testament. Um, they were arrested, there was a, under the guise of something being wrong with their license on their car. If they were put in prison, and whilst they were in prison, they did make a real difference. Uh, often, it, it seemed a whole different system, but they had to stay in prison whilst a lot of the other inmates were allowed out day by day. And because it was fairly transient, they conditions were really bad. So the girls cleaned out cells, washed dirty linen, um, they would pray for Muslims, and whenever they were asked why they were there, they told them, and, and they brought lots of people to, church, to, to Christ as well. And the other big difference they had was that when they prayed, their prayers were answered. Muslims pray five times a day, but it seems really hit and miss, that if Allah is in a good mood, he may answer your prayers, and if, he, if he's not, he doesn't. But as Christians, they could pray for healing, they could pray for situations that something would happen in court, and time after time after time, God answered the prayers, and so they brought many people to Christ as well. And their last testimony is going to be from a Syrian lady. And obviously you know what's been going on in Syria. Dear brother, dear sister, I knew that the threats were serious. We lived there all our lives. We should have left when we first heard the call of the mosque minarets. Maybe I never thought it would happen to us. I know it seems naive looking back. Four months ago, my beautiful eldest son saw some boys he knew stealing from the church and <coughs> shouted to them to stop. They seemed to go away, but a few minutes later they came back with their faces covered and grabbed him. They told him to renounce Jesus and proclaim Muhammad or we'll kill you. 
I'm ashamed to say that if I'd been there, I think I'd have pleaded with him to say whatever they wanted to save his skin. But I'm so proud of him that he refused. Three times, three times they shot him. I'm not sure whether I've lost one son or two. My youngest son, now my only son, is 12. Like so many others, he's growing up with a school bag, not with a school bag in a hand, his hand. He's growing up with a gun. The changes began after his brother was killed, and I don't know how to get through to him. He scares me sometimes. He won't even sleep without a gun. Keeps saying that he needs it to avenge his brother's death. I try to remind him about Jesus and what he endured, whipping, mockery, a torturous death. Even on the cross, he opened his arms and had a thief on his right and on his left. He forgave, he loved. It might sound bizarre, but in the midst of the horror of this war, in makeshift accommodation, in the smarting grief, but in the last few months, I'm catching a glimpse of a Jesus who is more loving, more tender, more compassionate than I ever realised. The Christians from the church here seem to really care about us, to love us almost. Even my son, with all his jagged rage, they give us food and blankets, cooking oil and medicines. They asked my son's shoe size and have even managed to get some trainers <clears throat> for one of the boys in the church. They didn't have to do that. They didn't have to do any of it. But I can hardly bear to think what I would have had to do to feed and clothe us without this help. Receiving these things so freely given is like a cup of cold water to a thirsty soul. The church here is like a lighthouse, beautifully light, in a place that is desperately dark. What touches me most is that the young couple who bring us our food, food parcels always <coughs> offer to pray for us. I can feel myself beginning to heal. My son usually storms out when they offer to pray for him, but today, wonderfully, he let them pray over him. And as they prayed, he began, for the first time since his brother died, to weep. There was such a beautiful presence. Maybe I haven't lost him, after all. Please pray for <coughs> us. So if any of these people came here, I'm sure you would be helping them and looking after them. And with Open Doors, we can do this for our wider family. We do learn from them, we can give back to them. We can encourage them by writing postcards and letters. And we have, Open Doors has a letter writing um, program that enables you to do that. And because we've got people on the ground, you send your car to, to our head office, we send them to our people on the, on the ground there, and they do get through. The girls in prison that I told you about receive sackloads of, of letters every day, and they never saw one of them. But the guards had to go through them, and they would get these verses and say, well, who is this Jesus? What's this about? They knew they were getting them every day, largely because the guards were moaning. But they also believed that made a difference, because the authority on the world and so they couldn't do anything drastic to them, and they were released and they now live in America. Uh, and often it makes a real difference. People who are in, the, in those situations think they're alone, and to get a card from somebody miles away who they don't know is a real encouragement to them. Somebody in prison said, your cards were like oxygen to me. And you can do that so easily, just in your own home, for the cost of a second class stamp. You can campaign. There are, every so often we have on our website campaigns and you just do a few things <coughs> and your letter is with the Foreign Office or with the Iranian Embassy, whatever's going on at the time. You can visit. We have trips every year where it's possible to go and meet with persecuted Christians. The hub is a universal language, so if you're not fluent in Farsi or Egyptian, it doesn't matter. You can give. We told you all the things we do, you throw money at us, we can use it. But most important of all is to pray. Um, we have a, a magazine that goes out every two months. Every month you'll get a prayer diary. 
we ask you to pray for different topics for two minutes a day, which doesn't sound a lot. You might think, well, two minutes, it's hardly worth the effort. 30,000 of those go up, that's 60,000 minutes of prayer, which is roughly six weeks. My God, if he's having his ear open for six weeks on one topic, is almost certain to do something about it. So your two minutes does make a difference. If you want to meet in groups, we have CDs that will be sent to you. If you want to join with other Christians, go to Holland Road on the third Monday each month. If you want to get text reminders or email reminders, we can do that as well. Um, but prayer is so important. As I said, around the world, people realise and far more than we do, just how critical prayer is and how important it is, how vital it is, and that's what we would encourage you to do. Um, and on top of all the things we're doing, we have um, a special appeal, and if you'd like to put the thing on, I will tell you about our special appeal. Very often, ah, ah, very often it doesn't work. Which is why I carry my piece of paper with me. Okay, so I'm wearing a cross today as a piece of jewellery. Geoffrey has a cross on a ring. Anyone else wearing a cross? But we all recognise it, don't we, as an image that marks out Christians. Now, in Iraq and in Syria, there is a different image that marks out Christians. Thank you. So this is called a nun, it's an Arabic N, you get it at the beginning of the word Nazareth, where Jesus was born, uh, N at the beginning of Nazarene, the name of someone who comes from Nazareth, and N at the beginning of Nazarite, a person who follows Jesus, thank you. And um, this sign has been painted on the walls of people's dwellings. So in a city in Iraq, this is what the walls look like in the dwellings there where there were Christians. They woke up and they had nuns painted on their wall. They didn't do it, someone came into the city and did it. And two or three days later, people from IS came and they went to all the homes that had a nun painted on the wall and they gave them an ultimatum. So number one, they could renounce Jesus and turn to Islam. Number two, if they didn't want to do that, that was fine. They could pay a fine, but the fine was so big nobody could afford it. And number three, they would kill them. And the threats always end with, or oh, we will kill you. Thank you. In Syria, in cities where Christians and Muslims had lived side by side in peace for years, the threats came from the minaret. It might be worth saying that uh, you know, when the war started, Christians didn't want to fight. So if they didn't fight with the government forces, the rebels fired on them. If they didn't fight with the rebels, the government fired on them. So they were, they were in the middle. And then this developed that the imams went into the minarets and said, OK, Christians, we don't want you in our city. You must leave. You must go or we will kill you. Uh, a few months ago, I was having a conversation with a, a non-Christian friend of mine about the refugee problem in Europe. And uh, she said, well, I can solve that problem. This is not a problem. All you have to do is send them all back. And I thought, I wonder if she realises what she would be sending people back to. Thank you. So if you were sent back, this could be your church door. Thank you. This could be your sitting room. Uh, we, I read a, a letter from Hannah. Hannah and Yusuf, uh, living in Damascus, had to move out of their flat, not because they were damaged, but because the building they lived in was so structurally damaged, it wasn't safe to live in anymore. So people are pushed into smaller and smaller places. Uh, this is what your area of um, Sussex could look like. Very good, is it? It's, it's not surprising, is it, that people had to leave their homes, they were being threatened. Um, it's more surprising, thank you, that there are people who have, who, who have volunteered to stay because loads of people are trapped. Not all the refugees are in Europe. They're trapped 
in Iraq and Syria, they can't get out, and so it's really difficult. So this is Pastor Douglas. If you look carefully, you can see he's got a shadow here and a shadow here. This is where a bullet went in this side and came out this side. Pastor Douglas chooses to stay. And um, some time ago, thank you, he, he found 700 people were homeless and wanted to live in his church garden. And this is what it looked like when they arrived. Uh, and he was desperate. You know, these people need shelter, they need uh, food, they need fresh water. So he got in touch with Open Doors and within 12 hours, this is what his garden looked like. There was shelter, there was food. There was... We try to respond to people's needs. Thank you. And this is Pastor Daniel. He has a real heart for children. There are children who are growing up who have only ever known hatred and guns and rubble and blood. And he has a real heart for them and he wants them to have just a little bit of time when they can be children. So he got in touch with Open Doors and we provided him with this big tent and a few bits of equipment. And he has a space that is there where children can come and they can listen to stories. And I bet he tells stories about Jesus, don't you? And they can sing songs and they can play games and just for a small time they can be children. Thank you. People in Iraq and Syria are damaged physically. People in Iraq and Syria are damaged emotionally. Thank you. People in Iraq and Syria are just totally distressed. Particularly the old elderly. The elderly are confused. Older people don't expect to have to be moving around, living in a tent, you know, outliving maybe their children and their grandchildren. It's confusing and the children aren't having a childhood. So really, it's an unfortunate fact that people are having to move around in Iraq and Syria and they haven't got a stable home. It's a miraculous fact that some people choose to stay there. And it's a matter of fact that open doors are there with them. Okay? And we're trying to meet their needs and the most um, difficult thing, well no, that's not true. One of the most difficult things is uh, the lack of food. People are hungry. It's difficult to get food. And so that's one of the things that we're trying to address. Uh, if you look in the bottom left hand corner you will see there are people registering. You don't just go to the church and say, oh, I'm hungry, I want some food. You have to register. Uh, and then when there is food and when it is safe, you can see in the right hand bottom corner, members of the church go out uh, with the food, with blankets, with whatever's needed, and they're the people who stay in and pray with people and make a real difference. And in the top right hand corner you will see there is a Muslim lady who is registering for food. She's been to the mosque. The people at the mosque say, no, we haven't got any food, but if you go down to church, so the Muslims are coming to the church, Christians had to decide, what are we going to do? Well, when Jesus fed the 5,000, he didn't say, hey, who of you thinks you'll follow me? Mm, you can have some food. Sorry about the rest of you. He gave food to everybody. He died for everybody. He loved everybody. And so the Christians decided when they got food, they would share it with everybody. Uh, so they go into Muslims' homes, they take food, uh, they take whatever's needed, they pray with them, and Muslims are saying, who is this Jesus? Who is this Jesus who provides food for his people and then encourages them to give it away to us? And churches are running secret courses for Muslims who are wanting to know more and Muslims are coming to faith. Hallelujah. So out of all this awfulness, God can do amazing things, can't he? That's wonderful. So I, I'm here to tell you that it costs £71 to feed a family of five for a month. And feeding a family of five for a month is fabulous, but actually I don't think this is all going to be over in a month, do you? I don't think it's going to be... Um, finished and we really need to be going on and on. The United Nations tell us 
they're running out of money to give food to refugees or people who are displaced. So we need to carry on that work. So on our table over here we have literature and a purple bowl. If you feel that you would like to help in any way, please plonk something in the purple bowl. No coin is too small, no check is too large, no one will be watching so we <coughs> don't know what you do. Uh, but we will be amazingly grateful if there's something in our purple bowl to send off to the Iraq and Syria appeal. And over on there, this is craft that I've made. I sell it and all the profit goes to our Iraq and Syria um, appeal. Please, if you fancy anything, inexpensive. So the reason we're able to do that is that we knew churches and people in those countries before the trouble started. <coughs> and we've heard there about lots of displaced people. If they're Christians, there are no misplaced people. God knows where every one of them is. Open Doors wants every church to be on its knees in prayer and on its feet <coughs> in action. And as a final challenge, if IS came and took over Moll School, would that appear on the 